Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Marinac Council of the Arts Art Life Series event. I am not Jonathan Riddell. I was supposed to be Jonathan Riddell, but we are allowing John to conserve his energy for this fabulous solo that you will shortly see. So I'm filling in for his opening remarks. And with that, we want to thank Jackie and Shari and the entire Mamarinet Council of the Arts for this opportunity to introduce our work to you and share with you the process of creating the pieces that you'll see today. So second story, what is second story? Second story is a collective of dancers and choreographers who decided to start families while they were still at the peak of their professional careers because they wanted to continue their artistic development and take care of their children we created an environment where it is possible to do both, believe it or not. <laughs> we call it creating while caregiving. And it is totally different than anything these three dancers have ever experienced in their professional careers. As I'm sure you can imagine, it has presented unique challenges, but also some unexpected opportunities. The presence of our children in the studio has impacted our work and our process in a variety of different ways that continually shift over time, especially when one by one each child starts going to school. And we know some of you have been following the development of our second story uh, program on our Process in Real Time blog and Facebook page. We've enjoyed sharing the details with you of our process, almost in real time, but we really love to bring you into the process in person, most of all. Today we will perform four works. One is complete, the others are in varying stages of development. Each one has been choreographed by a second story dancer, Mandy Kirshner Salva, <laughs> Lorena Egan Alvarado, and our artistic director, Jonathan Riddell. Since we wanted to make this a truly collaborative experience, We'd like to discuss with you any questions that you might have regarding the works you're going to see today and the process of developing those pieces. So after the presentation of the dances, we will begin our discussion together as a group and then mingle with one another informally so you'll have a chance to speak with the dancers individually and of course take advantage of the Arts Council's wonderful refreshment table. At this time, Jonathan would usually introduce me. <laughs> so I'll introduce myself. I, again, am Sherry Malt, author of Portrait of an Artistic Journey, The Creative Process in Real Life Context, in which I examined the external challenges and internal struggles that shaped the development of Jonathan's work in Violent Circles, The Rite of Spring, that premiered at Ailey in New York in 2013. I've continued to track Jonathan's artistic development ever since that time, all the way through to this second story dance project, where I continue documenting the rehearsal process through both written narratives and more recently through video casts. So with that, we start today's program with a work by choreographer and dancer Lorena Egan Alvarado called Voices. This piece will eventually consist of five sections, but today we will see section one, a duet performed by Mandy and Lorena, followed by section two, a solo danced by Mandy. The entire work is set to a piece of music by Bach called, and help me if I, have this, if I get this right, uh, Lore, 
Tilga Hoekster mein Süden, based on Pergolesi's Stabat Mater. Now, for Lorena, the music is primary. Whenever she listens to this Bach music, in fact, any music at all, <laughs> she immediately feels compelled to move in a particular way. It's as if she viscerally internalizes the music and the choreography flows naturally right out of her body. She loves to find the undercurrents in the music, the notes and rhythms you might not necessarily notice. Lori's primary objective with this piece was to choreograph exclusively to the soprano and alto soprano melodies, creating movement that corresponds only to a singing voice is quite challenging. With her exclusive focus on music as the driving force for this particular work, Lorena has not yet determined whether or not she'll explore emotional or spiritual meanings. She does acknowledge, though, that the music evokes a sense of reverence, especially the very somber first section. But <coughs> she may not she may or may not choose to pursue either of these themes, so stay tuned. It, uh, it remains to be seen. So, ladies and gentlemen, voices.
Of Mandy. <laughs> when Mandy first joined Second Story, she informed her colleagues that she had absolutely no desire to choreograph. But after collaborating so closely with Jonathan and Lorena, Mandy found herself enticed by the prospect of creating her own piece that truly represents her idiosyncratic style. This particular way of movement is a natural outgrowth of years spent dancing with the Merce Cunningham and Stephen Petronio companies, acrobatic and physical, creating lines and shapes. We see the influence of these experiences in the choreography Mandy has created for Lorena. Mandy explains the differences between her style and that of Jonathan Lorena in this way. Mandy's approach is less about emotional expression and telling stories, and more about designing the body in space and playing with unexpected movement. Conceived as separate from the music, her choreography tends to be linear and abstract. Mandy likens her process to constructing a puzzle. As she adds on new material, she loves to see what the body is capable of doing next relative to the previous movement or pose. She enjoys pushing the limits of where the body can go, starting from a particular position. Since she originally created this piece without music, Mandy had to figure out all the dynamics of this solo without sound. While this can be a bit daunting for mere mortals, she relished the challenge and the creative freedom it provides. However, she always noted that if she did choose to use music, she would seek a sound that would create a certain atmosphere as opposed to providing a particular rhythm or structure to the piece. Eventually, Mandy decided to experiment with and ultimately chose an abstract piece of music arranged by composer Neil Alexander. As she continues to develop this solo, Mandy finds herself making a lot of changes. She continually sees the piece differently, in particularly with regard to the dynamics. But perhaps the biggest surprise in this new endeavor <laughs> is Mandy's discovery that she loves assuming a leadership role. It is both exciting and gratifying <laughs> to be in charge and determine how your vision takes shape. So ladies and gentlemen, Mandy's as yet untitled work. For Lorena. <laughs>
we continue our presentation with a solo choreographed and danced by artistic director Jonathan Riddell. Embers and Ash is set to music by Rafe Vaughn Williams called The Lark Ascending. Now, a number of major events in Jonathan's life form the context for the creation of Embers and Ash. The first is the arthritis in both hips that prevented Jonathan from performing for many years. This disease required two surgeries to repair and necessitated years of physical therapy. This period of time was quickly followed by the birth of his two children, health issues for his mother, and the decline and death of his father. As he wrestled with the ways in which he was impacted by these clearly life-changing experiences, Jonathan began creating a work that would enable him to explore his emotional landscape in several different ways. Approaching the piece on a metaphorical level, Jonathan sought to convey images of the mythical phoenix, a creature that consumes itself in flames and is born again from its ashes. Developing the work on a psychological level, Jonathan wanted to examine the mental states of a man questioning his fate, struggling with change and loss, and ultimately finding power in a life transformed. He also discovered that he wanted to play with abstract uh, to, to play with the dance on a purely abstract level, investigating the increasingly complex development of simple movement motifs such as the flipping of hands. Jonathan envisioned this piece in three sections. He completed the first one in time to perform for our March 18th, 2017 showing then finished parts two and three, enabling him to, pre uh, to present the entire work at our May 6th, May 6th 2018th showing. It's a lot of numbers. Uh, although he approached the work from a variety of angles, his principal focus up till that time was on conveying the psychological and emotional experiences permeating his life for the last few years. Shortly after our spring showing, Second Story took a summer hiatus. And upon our return to the studio in September, the dancers were completely focused on preparing another one of Jonathan's works, Brittle Branches, which you will see in a moment, for its premiere at the November 10th Choreographer Showcase at the Emelin Theater. So Jonathan returned to work on Embers and Ash about a month ago. Now, since he wanted to delve more deeply into the other layers of this work, he decided to take a new approach. Get back the main structure and feel of the piece, then allow the details to come in organically. Incorporate improvisation, allowing each movement to unfold and inform the next one. Focus more on layers of abstract movement and the embodiment of the mythical phoenix, and less on his personal story of loss and rebirth. And really listening to and being grounded in his body at every moment, so his character's story can emerge organically. Today, Jonathan will perform part one of Embers and Ash using this new approach. Not only does this segment introduce the entire piece, but it also functions as a standalone work. Ladies and gentlemen, Embers and Ash.
Jonathan's next work and the final one for today is called Brittle Branches, set to Piano Trio Opus 21 by Antonin Dvorak, and just premiered at the Emelin on November the 10th. So it's a treat to see it intimately today for the first time since its premiere. Driven by the need to make meaning of the dramatic and painful events in his life that we spoke about earlier, Jonathan had a broad initial vision of a duet depicting two souls intertwined and at least one of those souls in distress. Then, as he fleshed out this idea, images signifying internal pain started to emerge, branches growing out of the body that represent both human limbs and supernatural wings. Fingers gripping the body in the throes of anxiety and stress. As he started to develop a portrait of psychological anguish, he envisioned one character serving as a source of support and resonance for the other character, an angelic figure, if you will, watching over and scaffolding another woman through her turmoil. Midway through the process, Jonathan explored alternate interpretations of the relationship between these two characters. He wondered whether the angelic figure was a symbol of benevolence or a more complex, multi-layered being. Might she prove to be a dark figure? eventually showing her, through her true colors. Maybe the two characters are equals, able to switch roles when one needs the other one to help. Then there's this. Could they represent constantly changing aspects of the same person? Well, as rehearsals continued, Jonathan gained some clarity into this so-called angelic character. He discovered that he didn't want her to watch over the other character from an emotional distance or provide support in some abstract way. Instead, he brought the angelic, the angelic character back down to earth, so to speak, joining the other woman in her struggle, communicating to her that the journey is difficult it's going to require grit and determination. She may need to pull the other woman along, but together they're going to navigate through these difficult internal experiences. So in this way, both the struggle and the emotional scaffolding are now more grounded. And the connection between the two characters are now deeper and richer. These dynamics become even more apparent when, toward the end of the dance, the two characters switch roles. The angelic character now dives into her own psychic struggles, a process facilitated by the emotional scaffolding of her partner. This time around, the process is characterized by even more intense emotionality. Jonathan has constructed this work so that the narrative, musical, and emotional arcs peak simultaneously. But through it all, the central element is always the relationship between these two characters. So ladies and gentlemen, Brittle Branches.
Well, we would like to turn over this portion of the afternoon to all of you to ask us questions about the pieces that were performed today and the process of developing each one of them. So perhaps you'd like to know a little <laughs> bit more about the choreographer's creative inspiration. Perhaps you'd like to discuss different interpretations of the works. Um, maybe you'd like to find out how the choreographers worked collaboratively with their dancers to uh, develop each piece. Or maybe perhaps the most burning question of all, given that this is second story, is how did the presence of the dancers' young children in the <laughs> studio impact the way they work and the works that they Produced. So we turn it over to you, and the, our, ladies, I, are the ladies are changing. So you can, so you can, you can yeah. Can so we, you saved your voice for uh, <laughs> it's, it's coming. It's coming. for this portion time. So in one of the uh, little introductory remarks, I heard something about abstract movement, and, yes. and I'm wondering what is that opposed to? Um, well, um, I think of abstract as, um, just like in other forms of art, um, abstract would refer to looking at um, the elements of the work that are perhaps shape, color, um, space, things that don't necessarily involve storytelling, um, specific emotions, um, uh, embodying a character or portraying a character. Um, so the way an abstract work of art might be, you know, three triangles juxtaposed in just the right way, and they're just the right color, and isn't that beautiful and inspiring, as opposed to a work that depicts um, a man plowing the field. It's so only in dance, yeah. though. Okay. Yes. Yesterday. So in dance. I'm confused. Well, yes, and so in that way, uh, if you think of perhaps Mandy's piece as being quite abstract, it's um, largely about the lines that the dancers are making in their body, the amount of energy they're putting to their attack, or the quietness of their attack, things like that, where they are in space, and sort of the poetry of the piece just being in those abstract qualities. Here's my mom. <laughs> 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 That's right. Yeah. So we have two of our families here today. 
um, Sherry's and well, some of Sherry's family here, but not the not the the younger generation. Um, and because of my cold, again, I apologize. I I deposited my face with the future. Um, but uh, yes, uh, so we have we have our, our little ones here, and they were ever present. Oh, sure, sure. Let's let's. let's you want to introduce yourself? What's your name? Yeah. Sebastian, oh. yay! <laughs> Sorry, Edgar and my Eliza are not here today, but all five of those kids, um, throughout many of our rehearsals, were running across the floor, running up and hugging us in the middle of uh, working doing on this. pieces. Doing well, this. Yeah, in the middle of what we're doing, you know. While we were dancing. Uh, we would have to stop and change diapers, or stop and uh, help with food, and um, and uh, it, it was a riot. And now everybody's growing up. And now everyone's growing up. And now we just deal with like, oh, school closing, gotta run, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Did having the kids in the studio really change the choreography that you were working on, or was it just a, a, a interruption? Um, well, that's a great question. I'll, and I'll <coughs> let the other choreographers handle it too. Uh, for me, uh, I was very much affected by the pace at which we then would work. Um, and at first it was a struggle to get used to, um, but then I started to really appreciate it after a couple months. Um, and I realized that, oh, if I really just um, sort of nibble at my process, then in the space between rehearsals, I'd have a lot more time to think about the work. Um, so it was really like, you know, um, sort of molding each moment as it went on, as opposed to, you know, choreographing like three or four minutes being really excited about it, and then having to move back and sort of needle through it with refinement. So, um, so in that way, the process really changed for me. And I do believe that the two works you saw today were greatly affected by the amount of thought that um, each moment, um, as opposed to my other works. Were you guys at all? Um, for me, it made it more challenging to focus, because <laughs> I was used to just being in a rehearsal process. <coughs> where all you think about is yourself and what the choreographer wants you to do. And with the children, they were constantly wanting our attention and distracting us. Um, so it did take a while to get used to that. And you did eventually get used to it. And then when they're not there, you, you kind of wonder, yeah, yeah, it's too quiet. Like, we're getting more <laughs> done than usual. <laughs> is everything OK? <laughs> yeah. I think it's just kind of getting used to where you're at. Whatever situation you're in and stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same. same. <coughs> um, well, uh, for, for my work, it's different. My work is very physical. It's not very mental. So I have to get up and move around to make the choreography. I can't sit and tell someone how to do it. I have to get up and show them. So when I have my 10-month-old and then my 1-year-old, and he, we've been doing this since Sebastian was 8 months. So, you know, when he was in his little car seat stroller carrier just laying playing on the floor was a lot easier and then as he got older mm -hmm. like, but i really just want to go over here and make up this four count phrase just i just need four counts you know and it sounds like that a lot at this in the studio i need you to sit for 15 minutes mommy needs 15 minutes please which would actually end up being about 10 but even in that 10 minutes i would would be able to create something to work with um and like manny when they're not there it's like are we done in an hour, which used to take like a three hour process. So, you know, so, yeah. That's kind of my experience with that. Well, may I add uh, to address your question, Jackie? From the outsider's point of view, watching them, I really felt that the way in which they engage in this creating while caregiving um, dynamic became a beautiful choreographed dance in and of itself because I feel that all four of us jumped in in a way that maybe if you and Chari had been there, for example, would have looked almost seamless to address anything and everything that would occur in the moment to do anything possible to facilitate the work 
that needed to get done. And uh, it became almost second nature. Sherry was a lifesaver on, on, on many, many occasions where Mandy and I would be doing, working on the duet, and here comes my son pushing the stroller. Right! <laughs> yeah. Right as we're doing something very intricate, and here comes Sebastian. Sherry jumps up. Come with me, Sebastian. <laughs> you know, so, you know, she, she, was, she was pivotal in helping us get, get the work done. Yeah. I also developed a certain confidence to be able to create within chaos. Mm -hmm. That was another yes. expression that came up, creating within the chaos. Uh, whereas I once believed that I required like utter silence to think, to focus, and to be inspired. It was like, oh no, I can now. <laughs> <laughs> the subway system running behind me, and that's totally fine. So it's like a whole different muscle has been developed. Right. So you yeah. all have boys? Um, I have one boy and one girl. And, yeah, and, we are, and I have a boy. And these are my guys. Yeah. And <laughs> Sherry has a girl who is in high school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. have, have the kids shown any active interest in dancing in themselves? These guys, they like to move around and dance at home whenever I put music on. They're, they're flowing throughout their kitchen and putting their legs up. and. And you were doing a pirouette today. You were showing me Whoa. your arms up because we went to see a performance at SUNY Purchase yesterday too. Yes, so yes. We go over there a lot and support their dance department. Um, but no <laughs> formal training as of yet. So we'll, we'll keep it open. <laughs> My son's in the same boat. We did try a formal uh, dance camp with him for a week. He um, chose a spot in the studio to sit, and that was his spot. Um, and then he would get up and participate for like a minute. But at home, he's a dancing machine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, my daughter, however, is now doing, um, she's on her second year of classes, and she's in ballet class one. She's three and a half, so she's just a, like, <laughs> and it's sweet. And it's never too late to start yeah. dancing, right? Because I started dancing at 17, so there's hope for all of them. <laughs> if that's what they want. I'm Maxwell Theodore Savile, and I'm seven. Yeah. <laughs> 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 huh? you, uh, we're still in dance party mode. We just put on rock and roll and jump around the house. So he, he hasn't asked for it. But if I, if I say, hey, it's dance party time. What kind of music do you want? And he goes, rock and roll. He does it like, so, you know. He, of course, I don't know where he got that from. No. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> Um, so we, you know, he likes to move, run, jump, all that good stuff, but we haven't done any formal training. I ask, do you want to go take dance classes? And, you know, no, no, okay. <laughs> okay, not it yet. Would, it would be a dream come true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do uh, you have any future plans for performing some of these works in the next six months to a year? Do you have anything lined up? We don't have anything lined up yet. This is this is our sort of last gig for the year, and we're. I know I'm excited for a holiday for a moment, mm -hmm. um, but uh, we're then gonna sort of start to figure out what the new year holds. And we've been working quite diligently, at least our version of, of diligently, um, for a good while now. So we're. And we just had the MLN last month, and then this, and now that we've had these two shows, it it makes you excited and kind of crazy. Get back out there again and do more. Mm -hmm. So let's do more. <laughs> um, but if any of you want to join the Riddell Dance Theater mailing list, um, that's how you can get information as it comes up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions about the work? Or yeah. I just want to mention that in one of the dances that was choreographed without music, but then was danced to with music, it worked really well. <laughs> I would have yeah. thought that that was choreographed yeah. without music. Yeah, it's my choreography. And Lorraine and the dancing. Yeah, it's a, it's a technique. Good job, thing. Mom. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I danced for the Merce Cunningham Dance Company, so that's how he created his pieces. It was a dance separate from the music, separate from the scenery and costume, and then it all came together in the theater. So that, that, was a huge influence on me, and I appreciate his technique and 
way of looking at things. So um, I drew from that inspiration, and and that's what I was working with when I created Lori's piece. And I didn't have any any music in mind, and and um, I knew a composer from from the Princess where we went to school, and he let me listen to some of his recordings. <coughs> basically finished the movement at the same time as the music finished as well. Perfect! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At least <coughs> and then next year it'll get longer and we'll find something different and, and see what happens then. So a related question. As you're listening to music, it's in a space between the different art forms. Often have an abstract idea or a certain kind of set of movements that you love to put to music, and then you're on the hunt for the right piece. Or does the music evoke images and choreography in terms of that direction? I think everybody has a different response to that and how they work. Um, and in my in my work, it it will be from the music specifically. I'll be driving in the car, and a piece will come on, and be like, "Oh, what's this?" And you'll listen. I'll listen to it, and I'll see. I'll see the dance. I'll see the movement that goes with the music. I rarely come with an idea to a piece of music. Um, usually, most, 99.9% of the time, the music will come to me and it, then the piece will come through that and will develop, the music will evoke an emotion, a response, some sort of movement theme. Um, but then again, it's different for everybody. I know John works a lot, a, kind of those same lines and it, it, he'll have a story or see a, a, a through line or a, character type, um, but then you also search for music. Yes. You have ideas, yeah. and then you say, oh, I need the perfect piece of music for this idea, and I can't find it. Case in point, how many years ago? How many years the ago is that? Nanny? The Insightful Nanny? Oh, gosh. Was that like 1998 or something? No, 2000? He calls me up, he's like, oh, I have this awesome piece. It's so wonderful. <coughs> Said, well, tell me about it. We were and actually I, in our living room. We used to be we, roommates. Oh, were we, were we yeah. at home? Yeah. Oh, okay. We were roommates. And I said, I have the best piece of music for you. And it was, and I he listen to it, and he was like, oh, perfect. And it became this wonderful piece that he choreographed. So it's like different. It's just different. It was a know? piece inspired by Edward Gorey's Gashley from Tiny, which we had a poster of in our apartment. Yep. And I was like, I want to make that. And she went, I have the best piece of music for that. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what happened? I don't remember. Uh, no, it was, it was somehow it was like that. It was some version of that. Together, but yeah, um, absolutely. It can be. Yes, yes, absolutely, exactly. Absolutely. exactly. A lot of my work is inspired by literature, too, so you'll get these elements um, pulled in. Um, yes, absolutely. Sometimes music will inspire me. I'll get an idea from that. Um, that's often how it is, but then, like you said, I'll then be, say, oh, but that idea, it needs like a few more parts to it. So then I start looking for music. It's kind of like putting a show together, too. I have put, I, I use that Edward Gorey piece as a finale to an all Edward Gorey program, and I needed more music that would sort of work in that vein, and I pulled some jazz, I pulled some classical, I pulled some all these different styles. That was a real musical hunt. So that answer. And then, and, uh, like collaging and curating music together is a whole other way. It's really just whatever kind of gets the gears going. And I'm all about the movement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you start to music. Yeah, I love just playing with the movement and experimenting and and pushing people to see how far they can take things and challenge Lorena. Yeah. <laughs> And I always feel like a sort of organic music comes out of like the work that you do, like the rhythm that Lori winds up doing, uh, her footfalls, the amount of time she balances, like all of that yeah. has its own sort of the natural musicality, like a, a nature rhythm to it. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful to me. I have one kind of technical question. I always wonder about the breathing in here. Is that choreographed? 
paragraph too, like you really, like in that one piece of yours at the end, the breathing gets stronger and it's almost mm-hmm. kind of music. Yeah. Is that an element that you guys think about? Or what well, that? yes, it's a great question. I think some, it, it depends on the piece, uh, some people choose to highlight that or to integrate that. Some people, um, when they're directing the piece, will say, okay, take this take this time to really breathe, to settle your breath, and then rev up and go. Um, other times, it's just what you got to do to get the piece. Yeah, you're just out of breath. Yeah, sometimes you're just out of breath. And, and, and then, again, is it the choice to disguise that or allow that to be? Um, in my piece, I absolutely let it be. If the character is revving up to kind of a, a fever pitch, and then in parts two and three it gets even more. Uh, so by the end of part three, I am, I mean, I'm panting. Um, and, um, but that's part of the piece, it's part of the portrayal of the character. So, yeah, I mean, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. I have a question I thought would be interesting. Um, and John, maybe you can uh, let everyone know uh, the professional companies the three of you danced with, because John and Mandy and Lori, as you probably noticed, have three fairly distinct styles of working and of movement with some overlap. And I always wondered, interesting here, second story, a um, collective of three quite unique ways of working and styles. And how did you ultimately integrate those three in the way that you have? Uh, Okay, that's a great question. Um, Well, let's start with the our histories. Um, I danced with the Limon Dance Company um, for about 10 years, right out of college. Um, and in the midst of my career there, I also formed this company, my own company, um, and continued with that up until we started then this dance project. Um, but absolutely, my training was in the Limon uh, style and technique. Breath is absolutely <laughs> something we uh, focus on in every class. Um, and uh, also my training before that was at SUNY Purchase. Right on. Um, I have the SUNY Purchase as well. And I danced for Merce Cunningham and Liz Daring Dance Company and Stephen Petronio Dance Company after that. Um, and then I had this one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I went to Juilliard in the city, and then I danced with um, Pascal Liu for about 10 years, and then Mark Morris for a few years, and then moved to Westchester and had a baby. Mm-hmm. And then I came here. And then we found each other. And then we found other. each other. Yeah. Our common yeah. thread is John, so, you know, John <laughs> called me and said, I really want to get in a dance studio. Yeah. I said, yeah. Can I bring my son? He goes, yeah, I'm going to have my kids too. I said, awesome. Let's go. <laughs> Take the train. I'm white plane. So, you know, those are, that's our, you know, and then he's like, I got a great friend. She's going to come. Awesome. Good morning, Mary. So. Mandy reached out to me on Facebook. We <laughs> knew each other at Purchase Facebook? back, I mean, like 20 years ago. Um, and then, and then all of a sudden, Yeah. Yeah. And then 
hip-hop feature turned into a studio play date with the kids running around. And then, and then the next week we were the dance number. <laughs> <laughs> It's not so unusual anymore, though. It's, it's, you don't think? I don't think. I think more and more um, families are being started by women and, and men and families who, who, who at least one of the uh, primary caregiver will still be there <coughs> in the company while having kids. You know, so it's not so rare anymore. It was, and so everybody in our generation grew up under the uh, thought process that, well. Now you're a parent, you are no longer a dancer, that is done. You know, that was our mentality, that's what we were told. Your career was over at 35, you, and if you decide to have, you have to decide to either have a family or a career. That was our, that was my upbringing anyway. Mm -hmm. So I think that has changed a little bit. I see photos and, and people have contacted me and sent me pictures and said, hey, I had a baby, but I gotta go on tour, you know. My parents are watching my kid, you know, and then they'll fly and meet me here, and then they'll fly this. You know, so it's more common than not now, but it's I, still I not. I didn't know any. I maybe knew one person who managed to continue having a career right. who had a child. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, mm -hmm. I never even considered that would be an option mm -hmm. when I started a family. And yeah, I never imagined what life would be like without dance. Mm -hmm. and I miss it terribly, so here we are. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, exactly. <laughs> I, I think what's unique, Cher, is, as, as I think you know, is having the in the studio as part and parcel of your work. Would, would you guys agree? I mean, that was pretty groundbreaking. Yeah, I think um, you, you might have a company that could afford to have someone bring their kid on one day. Right, Perhaps right. They're part of a large ensemble, so maybe that person can sit it out a little bit, um, but that would really be a rare, like, bring your kid to work day kind of moment. Right, um, right. What we set up was really just um, totally cuckoo bonkers, but it worked. Totally <laughs> cuckoo bonkers, <laughs> but it worked. Like, totally. it was a big experiment, but, yeah. like, it just kind of kept working, and we kept coming back, and, um, and now two years later, we, we have four works that we're proud of. That I'm proud of. Um, and, um, it's interesting, I, um, part of your question was how do our styles, how do we do our styles? Mm -hmm. um, it's when I was watching these guys perform my duet just now, what just rang in my head was, they have been dancing together for two years, look at them. You guys were like so beautifully, not just together, but like moving from the same impetus. Um, you could tell, I could tell that, that they've been working together and been friends and bonding now for six years, and I think that that meant a lot to me. Um, I mean, technically, our um, our styles overlap in varied ways. We have the, we came from the same school. Um, our school taught similar techniques. Um, there's, you know, breath is used in different ways. The the, the way our different techniques explore the body um, has overlaps, and it just sort of takes those conversations and so how do you want this? Do you want it the way I do it or do you want to do it? Do you want me to do it like you or do you want me to do it like me? Yeah. And the answer varies moment to moment. Sometimes it's like, no, I love the way you do it. You do your thing and other times it's like, mm, come here, let me show you how that's done. So yeah. you know, um, and, uh, so it's a big conversation. So, you know, along those same lines, the challenge for Mandy's piece, who is all mm. shape, you know, for myself as the dancer in it, to find my, my um, style goes out the window. <laughs> and I've gotten notes from her. She's like, yeah, no, it's not quite right. <laughs> you're, you're too like this. I need it like this. And she would show the move. I'll be like, okay, I think I can do that. Let me see. <laughs> like I have to think about changing my movement style. My natural form of movement is not like hers. It's not her choreography. It's, I mean, it, it's not, uh, it is her choreography. So I have to look like, kind of like her when I do it, um, which is a challenge. Hmm. It's all a challenge. Jonathan, I'm pretty, I, I, I have a little bit more wiggle room in. 
<laughs> but you know, and you get choreographers like that who are like, no, that's not right. You have to do it like this and only like this. Whereas here we're a little freer, except in Mandy Keith. <laughs> creating a duet on them where I was also exploring a relationship and emotional ideas um, at a higher priority than the exact design of things. Um, I was sort of inspired by their different movement styles and um, their different approaches um, and then had to kind of um, see where the overlap was and um, say, okay, well this is going to be our neutral and then this is where Lori can take it. That's fine. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Come here, baby. Come here. Come here. I think perhaps we should um, allow everyone to rise. And um, if you want any more um, snacks, if you, we can mingle for a few moments. Um, if you have any uh, questions individually for us, we are here to keep chatting. Um, and, and thank you, thank you everyone, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Terry.